Welcome to Take It From The Top. I'm Chris Ross, manager of Washington DC's famed Blues Alley and your host. Blues Alley has hosted some of the finest musicians to ever walk the planet. We have four of them here for you. Four Generations of Miles is four super musicians teamed up to celebrate a music icon, Miles Davis. Jimmy Cobb on drums, Sonny Fortune on sax, Buster Williams on bass, Mike Stern on electric guitar. Let's have a listen. What was the impetus of the band? Whose idea was it? How did it come about? It was originally uh, Chesky Records that kind of came up with this concept of, of four generations of miles, but it was a different uh, configuration. It was with Ron Carter and George Coleman originally. We actually recorded one thing live, but then then we we kind of Jimmy and I kind of without really talking about it, kind of it kind of. Uh, uh, changed, you know, with this, to this, this, this membership, you know, which to me is a brand new band. I mean, we could call it Four Generations of Miles or something else. I mean, we've all played with Miles Davis in, in different generations. But when you get guys like Sonny Fortune and Buster Williams, it becomes that band. You know, they're such strong personalities, amazing musicians. And uh, so it's a whole different band. We want to record 
we've been talking about forever, and it's hard to get everybody's schedule and all, but want to record another something, maybe in the studio, or maybe live, with different tunes, you know, doing different standards or maybe some originals. Because this band, for me, is a ball. I'm always like, when, whenever I hear we got a gig, I'm going, yeah, that this one I'll have a ball on. You know, it's always fun. We should do it live in Blues Alley. We're ready for it. Yeah, be yeah. the next trip around. Yeah, bring the stuff in tomorrow since we're here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, each of you played with different with Miles Davis at different points in his career. What sort of, for me, you know, as not a musician, when you hear a song, it immediately takes you back to a certain point. So, what kind of feeling is there a song like when you hear a song? Is there a song, just immediately take you back to a certain point, or what is it? Well, I guess it all goes back to Miles Davis, in one way or another. And when, uh, with whatever time we played with him together, you know, the feelings is about Miles, I guess. So we play a lot of Miles songs, you know, and uh, we can all remember where we were and what we did and when it happened, you know, we remember Miles. So, and another thing I want to add to what he said about the conception of this music, it was, Jesse was a friend of my, my wife's, her name is Elena, and she, it was her con concept to put this together to make the record. You know, so I want to give her a little, oh, yeah. her little wow. kudos. Don't want to get out the boss. You know, because if I don't, I can't go home. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I'd like to That's put that cool. in there. It was, it, better put it, it, in there. it was a great idea. I'm just so glad it, it's keeping going. And, and I especially like this configuration. It just vibe-wise, it just works. It just seems loose and, and together at the same time, which, you, you know, and, and I get inspired every time playing with these cats. You know, How do you together. pick the songs? I mean, is it just sort of songs you played with Miles or just songs sort of that come catch the spirit and sort of roll with it? Kind of like that. And, mm -hmm. we, and we played some of these tunes we, we recorded on, a, on that earlier record with Ron Carter and George Coleman. That was a different band. And uh, that's why I say I want to do another. We, we're all kind of talking about doing another uh, recording with, with different tunes. With, with some of Miles' tunes, and or that Miles had played, some standards or some originals, and some originals, I guess, you know. But so, how has the band evolved since I know you, Ron Carter and George George Coleman oh. were the original members, and how did Buster and Sonny come into the band? Just they were the cats that kind of we we kind of uh, originally Buster did it with with George. And uh, and then and then Sonny started doing it. You know, we said you know because George couldn't couldn't do it, didn't was going through, I guess some stuff that he didn't feel like playing so much, and um, so Sonny was available. And then when you know it just completely changes when you get cats like that. And and it's just for me, it's a it's a I love that combination too. It was great, but this for me is just works better. I mean, it just seems like it's goes in a different place. I, I think that leads know. us into hearing a couple more tunes. You guys up to play us a couple more? Yeah. The next thing is um, uh, this kind of free ad-lib thing, right? You say the ad-lib of the ad-lib. Uh, ad-lib of the ad-lib. We, <laughs> we call it the lib. Well, here we go with the lib. Thank you. 
I'd like to take this time just to sort of get an experience from each one of you guys and dealing with Miles Davis and the music and we'll just start with uh, Mr. Fortune. We'll start with Jimmy because well, Jimmy I, was We'll first. go chronologically. Mr. Yeah, Jimmy uh, was Mr. Cobb started in 1957 to I think 1963 and you were playing yeah. on the most seminal, one of the most seminal jazz records of all time. Miles called me one night and says, uh, Joe is not going to be in the band and we want you in the band. You know? So I said, okay. So he says, uh, I said, well, what's happening? We didn't talk money or nothing. I said, what's happening? He says, uh, well, I said, where are you working next? He said, actually, I'm working in Boston. I said, in Boston? Yeah. So I'm, now I don't know it, but he's in Boston now talking to me. <laughs> and I'm in New York. You know, so he says, uh, yeah, well, we're in Boston. You know, I said, oh, yeah? He said, well, what time do you start? He said, 9 o'clock. So it's 6 o'clock. <laughs> You know, Boston's like 400 miles. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, how, how am I going to do that? He said, you want the gig, don't you? <laughs> I guess that's jazz. you got to improvise in, it, in every sense of the word. So I scuffled and got up there. And, you know, they had a shuttle that, that left. It would come here in 55 minutes or go to Boston in 55 minutes, you know. So uh, I got the drums together and went to Boston. And to George Ween had, uh, had, you know, had a club. That's the club we was, he was working in. So when I got up there, they were playing already, you know. It's like a, so okay, I snuck up and, uh, and set up the drums and they were playing around about midnight. And there's a spot in there where it's like an interlude and the band says, ba, 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 ba. And I played that with them and I was in the band. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Buster Williams. 1967, I believe you said was the year. One recording you did with him, but you played many gigs. Yeah, I was living in um, uh, Los Angeles at the time. I was with Nancy Wilson, and uh, I had just moved out to Nancy, out to Los Angeles, because Nancy wanted to relocate, and she wanted the band out there, and I had just got married. So as a wedding gift, she moved me and my wife out to. Los Angeles, and this day I was, I got a phone call and it was Herbie Hancock, and he said, uh, Miles wants you to uh, come up to San Francisco tomorrow. We open at the both end. So uh, after I hit my head on the wall a few times, mm. <laughs> I said, sure, I'll be glad to. So, um, and it just so happened that Nancy was taken off for about five or six weeks. So I went up to uh, San Francisco and joined Miles and worked for him those uh, five or six weeks. And um, uh, he wanted me to stay with the band, but I was doing so good with Nancy at the time. I just bought a yellow Stingray Corvette. Ooh. And uh, Nancy was paying me um, every week whether we worked or not. What do you call that? I don't know. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, uh, so I did this stint with Miles, and then he came back to L.A. the following year, and I did another stint with him. And we went in the studio uh, one day and recorded one song. Uh, I think it was uh, Wayne Shorter's, um, what was it? Um, uh, Water Babies, something, 
I forget what it was. And um, so, yeah, so when I was in the band, it was Wayne Shorter, Herbie, and uh, Tony Williams. So this was 67, 68. Mr. Fortune, we'll keep it chronological here. I, uh, I read where you were with McCoy Tyner and Miles had asked you to join the band. You turned him down once and, and then he came back around, looks like 1974, and you, you decided to accept. And uh, did you get the same sort of uh, immediacy in your invitation to the band? <coughs> well, what had happened was uh, at that particular time, I was working with Buddy Rich's band and uh, uh, Max Gordon asked me, did I want to bring a band in the Vanguard? And uh, I said, absolutely, because I had been working there uh, prior to that with McCoy. And uh, so uh, Buddy and then then wanted me to take off to go in the Vanguard with my band. But I told him, I said, man, <laughs> I have no choice. Uh, but anyway, so, and he was getting ready to go on the road. So the last night, uh, Miles came up to me uh, at the corner of the bandstand. You want to join my band? And uh, that's how it all came about. So uh, I went back and told Buddy that I was going with Miles. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go over? How'd that go over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Tell about the, the reaction. Well, his manager said, uh, you know, I mean, you're going to, you're going to, I said, uh, hey, man, I, yeah, I got to go with Miles. So, and, and what made it a little easier, uh, we were getting ready to go on the road, and I, I wasn't necessarily looking forward to going on the road. Uh, so, just by coincidence, uh, it worked out from the vanguard to miles <clears throat> and that's how it all came about now mike you catch him in a completely different uh part, point in his life in the music you joined in the, in the 80s so tell us about that in the sort of the electric he, period he'd been uh i mean you were in kind of in the electric period too. Well, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's, that's what i wanted to mention yeah. that that uh, uh the lib that we played was kind of in the concept kind of, of a little a, bit <clears> <clears throat> when we work with Miles, it was more in the fusion. Uh, and, and more open in some uh, Electronic. Uh, he was always pretty open, right? Even the way the way he would play standards was always... Right, it was always his way. He didn't say, it was his way, but it seemed like, to me, he never told somebody, you got to do just this. Right. Sometimes he would do it, but most of the time he'd try to leave it open so somebody's personality he could wanted, shine. Yeah, your, yeah. your sound, yeah, exactly. he wanted that's, you. That's why he that's wanted That's why you. he put... Right. So, so after um, he'd been in retirement, he... He, uh, Bill Evans, uh, he hired Bill Evans, who was recommended by Dave Liebman, you know, who played previous, you know, and, and, um, and Miles had been off for like seven years, something like that. And Bill and I played a little gig at a little place in Boston, and Bill said, I'm going to recommend you to Miles because he's got a guitar player, but he, they're not really getting along. And I knew the guitar player was a beautiful player, but it wasn't working out personality-wise. So... Uh, so he uh, eventually he heard me with Billy Cobham I was playing there about a year after Bill had said you know he was going to recommend me and Bill called me up there was a little pay phone on the wall it was at the at the, the bottom line mm. and he said you know I'm bringing Miles to hear you and I said oh sh so uh, <laughs> so he brought Miles down and Miles really dug it so he calls Billy off the bandstand. Oh, we're playing, and he calls Billy Cobham off the bandstand. You know, Billy Cobham, great drummer, While you're of course. Playing. While we're playing, and he says, tell your guitar player to be a studio B tomorrow in Columbia Records at such and such a time. So Billy gives me that message after. We're, we're playing, where's, where's the drummer? It's his gig, you know. And, uh, and, and anyway, Billy, we finished the set, and Billy passed that along. I, I mean, I grew up as an electric guitar player listening to Jimi Hendrix and, and Jeff Beck and a lot of rockers and, uh, and blues players and playing on, on the radio, or, you know, a lot of Motown, you know, stuff. I grew up in Washington and, uh, and there was a lot of soul music on the radio. I play along with it, you know, it's kind of, but, but when I got into jazz, that was my, what I kind of uh, started loving completely is more straight ahead, quote unquote, straight ahead, and then trying to mix it up, you know, in, in a way, because I didn't want to, 
say, okay, I, I never listen to the other stuff, which is in my heart also, you know what I mean? But, but uh, so I had to kind of mix it up. But, but um, and, and Miles was totally open to that. He liked the fact that me and, uh, uh, who was playing at the time? Well, Bill, of course, was, mm -hmm. a, was a great bebop player, you know, a great jazz player to Bill Evans. He liked all those lines, he liked all that stuff. And so it was very interesting, man. But at first, we didn't think he knew what he was doing in some ways. It was so loose, you know. At one point, Gil Evans was there. We were rehearsing at his, at his uh, house on 70, 70, 74th Street or something like that, his apartment. Uh, 77th. 77th. And we'd rehearse up there. And, um, and Gil was, you know, kind of helping him put his concept together, kind of. And it was loose. He had an idea, but he wasn't quite sure. So one time Gil was playing, hey Miles, remember this? Right, he was playing a little melodica, real up high. And Miles, because he used to quote from that tune. It was a French folk yeah, song. Right. And it was, and then he started playing it. Marcus goes, boom, 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 boom. And it became Jean-Pierre. And Miles put his name on it. It's actually a French folk song. He did a lot of that. <laughs> well, on that note, let's get into an, uh, one more tune. You guys will play one more for us? Yeah. Here we go with Four Generations of Miles.
Thank you.